on our week. Um, our speaker should be arriving momentarily. Before, um, before I introduce Professor Carrington, who will introduce our speaker, I just wanted to give you a little background on the history of Honor Week. This is the fourth annual Honor Week. It's something that um, I hope doesn't sound trivial to all of you. It's something that every time we talk about it, we usually get some snickers because it seems people are a little cynical. Um, but at the same time, we also have received a lot. We receive a lot of feedback every year from students who say it's you know it's good to have a reminder about these things and it's good to talk about things like honor and integrity to show that we all um, that it is something that's very important to our community, and in fact, it's something that is incredibly important to our profession. As I said, this is the fourth annual Honor Week. It was grounded um, in the creation of the Duke Blueprint to Lead, which you know I will take every opportunity to get up and wave this thing in front of your faces. But again, um, I hope that people are not cynical about the blueprint. The one prong of the blueprint that changed, that has changed since it's, it, it first was developed a few years ago, was changed at the encouragement of students last year who felt like the second prong, which now reads embody integrity, they felt like the, it, used to, it used to read act ethically. And students last year said they felt like acting ethically was just such a low standard that it should just be assumed that everyone acts ethically when they come here and that being at Duke Law School, they expected a higher standard. So after a lot of discussion, great, great discussion with probably many of you who are actually in this room, the decision was made to change um, act ethically to embody integrity, which we believe is representative of a slightly higher standard. Some of you have um, asked me recently, you have heard, especially second years, of efforts that were underway last year to revise the Honor Code. And those efforts are still underway. This, there was a student task force that worked over the co course of the last two years to suggest changes to the Honor Code that would make the Honor Code something less rule-based and more um, aspirational, and that would still include the rules that are listed in part five of, of the student rules. Is our speaker? Um, Hello. And the, the faculty administrative committee is currently looking at the student draft of the report. And um, so as it stands right now, the honor code that's listed in your student academic planners is the honor code that stands. Um, but stay tuned because probably in the course of, definitely in the course of this academic year, probably early next semester, we'll have news of the debut of a new honor code that will be um, sort of reflect the same, print, the same thought process that went into changing act ethically to embody and embodying integrity. Before I introduce um, Professor Carrington, who will introduce our featured guest, um, I would just also like to recognize another special guest we have in our presence, and that is Mel Wright. Mel, you could be recognized. <laughs> uh, Mel is the executive director of the North Carolina Chief Justices Commission on Professionalism, and he's a great friend of our law school, as is the Chief Justices Commission. Um, through very generous grants from the commission, we are able to have a keynote address. Um, and we are able to do things such as the leadership retreat, the public interest retreat, and the day that is dedicated to ethics and integrity during orientation every year. So we are very appreciative of not only the financial contribution, but even more important, to the support of Mel and the, the Chief Justice's Commission, which was also instrumental in our being selected last year as the 2005 ABA winner of the award for most outstanding professionalism program in the country. So thank you very much, Mel. We really appreciate it, and we're glad you're here. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Professor Carrington, and I'm going to make sure that our, our speaker is mic'd properly. Thank you, Jill. Uh, it's uh, an honor to me to uh, introduce to you one of the, uh, surely on a, on a very short list of the most eminent legal academics of my generation. Mark and I were born the same year, uh, and uh, uh, I take uh, a pride in, in the achievements of uh, our age group, but Mark is certainly one of the premier uh, academics. Let me tell you just a little about his career. Uh, he uh, graduated from college a whole lot sooner than I did because he went to the University of Chicago and was rated as uh, they, they take their very smart students and, and do hurried things with them. So uh, he was uh, early getting out of college. Uh, and uh, by 1957, he was uh, not only an alumnus of the University of Chicago Law School and had won a lot of honors there, but he was in India uh, on behalf, uh, it, was the, it was the Ford Foundation Fulbright. that was, Fulbright, it was a Fulbright, okay. Uh, it was a Fulbright, uh, 
And uh, he acquired a, a, a deep interest in India, and a lot of his work has been about the law in India, law and society in India. Uh, and from that, he branched out into a variety of other subjects. The first time I really became uh, aware of Mark's work was when he published a, an essay on why the haves come out ahead. It was a comment about efforts uh, conducted by a lot of organizations like the Ford Foundation that I spent a little time with and others uh, in trying to uh, bring democracy and uh, prosperity and American uh, traditions to foreign lands. And uh, the point of that essay was a very powerful one that what we do often turns out to get a perverse uh, response from the uh, environment in which our ideologies or ideas are are introduced, but um, he uh, has taught contracts for many, many years and is the author of a popular, uh, widely used uh, contract book, Contracts Law in Action. Uh, he has been uh, a leader in the law and society movement uh, involving uh, academic lawyers and thinking about things like how law interacts with uh, society and what are the roles of lawyers in achieving that. He's done a lot of books, and I just uh, will tick off the title of a few of them to uh, uh, elevate your interest. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, Day After the Litigation Explosion, which is a comment about the uh, tort reform movement and its exaggerated sense of, uh, of uh, what the problems were that uh, result from the fact that uh, businesses sometimes get sued. Related to that was the debased debate on civil justice. Um, he has uh, also done a very interesting piece of work on the tobacco uh, litigation, uh, and uh, uh, then one called the Tournament of Lawyers, which is about life in big law firms that some of you are uh, destined to experience, and uh, it's quite an elegant piece of work. And then uh, this current work is uh, about lawyer jokes, and that's what he is uh, here to tell us about. I should tell you also that in addition to being now an emeritus at the University of Wisconsin, uh, law school where he spent his career. He also uh, has a, a, a chair as a regular visitor at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, he has taught uh, in a variety of other American institutions and at Delhi, uh, University of Delhi, and in uh, Jerusalem. So uh, he's widely traveled and uh, has written a lot of very subtle and interesting stuff. And uh, I'm very eager to hear uh, what he has to say about uh, lawyer jokes. Uh, Mark? Thank you very much, Paul. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here and honored to be uh, part of this Distinguished Professionalism program. Um, and I think, um, I think the study of jokes actually fits in. Uh, uh, because lawyers, lawyers uh, uh, bestride American life, and uh, law, the law has become the kind of wall-to-wall -wall master order of our society. Now, I, I don't mean by that that law actually determines the course of what's going on in every other social institution, but it provides the site and the idiom uh, for debate about what's going on in every institution. And it influences them as, as a model, sometimes at least, as a monitor and, and as an intervener. So um, law is very central in American life. But unsurprisingly, not everyone is very happy about the centrality of law and the emergence of lawyers as the dominant profession in American society. In fact, almost no one is happy about it, except us a little bit. Uh, it's deeply resented by other elite groups, and it's irritating uh, to ordinary people, most of the time, anyway. So we find ourselves in this curious position uh, in which lawyers are flourishing and indispensable, but at the same time, detested and demoralized. Uh, and let me ask before proceeding, let me make sure, what, how long are we going on here? What time do you guys have to be somewhere else? 1.15. 1.15, okay. Well, let me uh, just 
proceed then, one, one of the, the, the prominent manifestations of the great swell of anti-lawyer sentiment in this country is the proliferation of jokes about lawyers. Uh, well, can we learn something from these jokes? Uh, clearly, we don't look to jokes for a balanced represent, uh, representation of the profession, for by their nature, jokes focus on flaws, weaknesses, and pretensions. And they're not a medium for fathoming life in its entirety. Uh, jokes are short. They don't really permit any development of character. They're one-dimensional. Uh, they, they, they don't uh, reflect the human situation in all its complexity. And as comic productions that diminish rather than ennoble their subjects, they, they evade profound dimensions of human existence. So, they're limited, but in a, another way, they're a good indicator of perceptions of society and its lawyers because uh, the sentiments that jokes express have to be shared rather than idiosyncratic. They don't register transient individual perceptions about lawyers, but shared perceptions that have been ratified and confirmed in successive tellings and retellings. So the persistence of jokes uh, is a useful indicator of enduring patterns of sentiment. Uh, and uh, jokes remain, in a curious way, the possession and voice of individuals. Uh, while the production of news, music, and even fairy tales nowadays are administered by large formal organizations, there's no Time Warner or Disney of jokes. Their small scale and cheapness make them unattractive as a profit center and leave them as one of the redoubts of individual expression. And for that reason, the, the take on lawyers and jokes is different than that in media that are subject to corporate packaging and corporate control. Anyway, lawyer jokes, as I'm sure you know, have a long history, a long half-life. There are scores of jokes in circulation today that would have been familiar to our counterparts two centuries ago. And, uh, but interestingly, lawyer jokes, although they're, they're quite prominent today, they are, haven't always been a very prominent part of the joke corpus. Uh, the, the, uh, somebody did a survey, I'm going to skip telling you about it about 40 years ago, and found that, that when they made up the list of topics of, of various kinds of jokes that were circulating, uh, they made up this list of 44 categories. Lawyers didn't even make that list. Uh, but their time was to come. Uh, really, in the 1980s, when lawyer jokes suddenly became very prevalent and very uh, visible, uh, so that you even began to get meta jokes about them. how many lawyer jokes are there? Oh, just three. The rest are documented case histories. Uh, the the so. Suddenly, there were a lot more jokes about lawyers. And uh, it wasn't only jokes that there were a lot more of. Uh, there was a lot more law. Just about every aspect of the legal world uh, was enlarged very dramatically. The, the amount and complexity of legal regulation, the frequency of litigation, the amount of, of, of authoritative legal material, the number of lawyers, and of course, along with that great increases in their coordination, their productivity, uh, the amount of money spent on, on law, the amount of information about law circulating in society, uh, the, the number of people using law, the, the, the amount of uh, people experiencing laws penetrating into more areas of life as they lived and observed it. So, the images and perceptions of lawyers multiplied along with the number of lawyers, uh, and um, with that, the, the number of lawyer jokes. Now, lawyer jokes have been around for centuries, uh, and there's an enduring core of, of the subjects or themes uh, the, the, of which the two, the two uh, most prominent over the centuries have been lawyers' talk and money. Uh, on the whole, the lawyer's linguistic uh, dexterity 
is not in their favor in the jokes. Lawyers are, are long-winded, they obfuscate, they split hairs, they confound ordinary sense, they lie. You know, what do you, how can you tell if a lawyer is lying? His lips are moving. Right? Uh, on the other hand, there's a counter current uh, of appreciation of the lawyer's eloquence and persuasiveness, and I, have to, I can't leave this one out because it actually, it's a joke that, at least in the first version of it that I have, which dates back to about 1870, uh, it, it's about a man in North Carolina who was saved from conviction for horse stealing by the very powerful plea of his lawyer. So after the uh, jury brings in an acquittal, they're walking out of the courtroom, the lawyer puts his arm around and says, now, Bailey says, just tell me, between trial's over, just between you and me, did you steal that horse or not? Now, look at here, Judge, he says, um, I did think I stole that horse, but when I heard your speech to that there jury, I'd doggone if I don't have my doubts about it. <laughs> now that, so, so there's, in many of these jokes, you'll notice that, that uh, Yes, the lawyer's being criticized, being mocked, but there's often a note of admiration or appreciation for the things the lawyer can do. Um, now, uh, here's, a, here's another joke about the lawyer's discursive prowess. Uh, a little different, uh, but, but you can see that the, in some sense, there's some kind of appreciation is still there. And this has to do with the search committee searching for the, uh, a president, a new president of the university, and they're down to the last three finalists, a mathematician, a sociologist, and a lawyer. And so the committee's had, the search committee's having its final meeting, and uh, they bring these three finalists there, and the mathematician's the first one brought in, and the committee members pepper him with questions about his views on the state of the university, of higher education, the university's financial uh, prospects, his theories of educational leadership, and so on. And he's just about to leave the room when a little old guy who hadn't said anything to him says, excuse me, excuse me, sir, before you go, can you answer one more question? How much is two and two? Hmm, the mathematician says, well, he says that's a deceptively uh, a simple question. It's really very complex, but for present purposes, we can say that if you take an abstract two and combine it with another abstract two, you get an abstract four. He goes out, the next candidate comes in, the sociologist, and they, the same battery of questions is sent, and as he's leaving, the little old guy pops up with the same question, how much is two and two? And the sociologist ponders for a moment, says, well, a very complex empirical question that requires a very careful collection and analysis of data. But roughly, he says, I would surmise that the range is somewhere from three to five with a mean of about four. <laughs> uh, and he walks out and the lawyer comes in and the lawyer's again questioned about his views at great length and as he turns to leave and opens the door of the committee room, the elderly member says, excuse me, sir, just one more question. How much is two and two? Lawyer stops in his tracks, closes the door, turns, slowly approaches the committee and says in a very soft voice, how much would you like it to be? <laughs> uh, now, uh, this joke was actually, it's, it, it appears as a lawyer joke in about 1982, but it had flourished for perhaps 30 years before that, all over Eastern Europe as an anti-communist joke. It was, it, 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 the point was the authorities' assistance on falsifying reality and the applicant's servility and the, you know, what does two times two make? Whatever the party says. Um, now, it, it, so, if, if that joke about the horse, did you steal that horse, is a kind of an indigenous joke. It's really situated in the legal setting. It would be difficult to make it work outside the, the legal setting. But two plus two is an adapted joke. It's a, it floats around. You, you can switch it from this topic to that topic. Uh, and in this switch, the, the, the lawyer 
it, it, it's given a, a nice distinctive twist that, that makes it very specific to the lawyer theme. It's the lawyer's readiness to put his ability to reshape reality to the service of the client. Uh, the, he, the lawyer solicitous, he says, how much do you want it to be? He closes the door, he speaks softly, and, and I collected many verses of this. He pulls down the shades, he checks for hidden microphones to protect confidentiality. So in contrast to these rather mechanical responses of the other candidates, the lawyer really seeks out the need behind the question. Uh, he, he takes the request as expressing some purpose of the questioner and indicates his willingness to serve that undisclosed purpose. And so, it's this, it's so there, in this joke, there's a lot of, of, of uh, resonance to the responsiveness of the lawyer, his willingness to focus entirely on your problem and his commitment to be your champion. Uh, now, whether he's going to be a faithful champion uh, is, is another Yes, another question. Anyway, this portrait I should mention is quite specific to the American lawyer. The joke exists in England and Australia, but without the body language, without the solicitousness of the lawyer. Anyway, jokes about lawyers' talk are a long-standing staple. And the, 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 other, the other great rival to that cluster of jokes is jokes about their pursuit of money, which, pursue, which portrays lawyers as as formidable predators, unwilling to move without fees, inventive in arranging matters to prolong their exactions, and so on. Now, among the most widespread and distinctive of these are jokes that are based on an equation with that emblematic predator, the shark. Uh, it goes back to the 19th, uh, really for several hundred years, this lawyer-shark uh, uh, equation. And uh, by, by the mid-20th century, it was the basis of, of the following narrative of that a minister, a scientist, and a lawyer drift on a life raft in the tropics. And at last, they see land, and they're very excited. And just as they seem to be drifting in the right direction, the wind dies down, and they're a short way off the beach. And the, 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 they compare notes on the lawyer seems to be the strongest swimmer. So he volunteers to go ashore with a line and pull the raft to land. So the minister kneels and prays for his safety, and the lawyer dives in and starts swimming toward land. And as they're looking and they're aghast because this great black fin appears and makes straight for the lawyer. And then suddenly the shark seems to disappear and come up on the other side of the lawyer. And then an even bigger shark comes along, but he too swerves and and. Uh, the lawyer reaches the beach and pulls the line in, and, and the minister turns to the scientist and says, you see, you doubter, there is there proof of the power of prayer. Power of prayer, hell, says the scientist. That's just professional courtesy. <laughs> uh, now, this shark image, again, testifies to the ferocity and power of the lawyer, and there's in many jokes, as I say, there's an undertone of appreciation. Here there's a tribute to the lawyer's capacity to pull off a risky, difficult feat for the benefit of his, quote, clients, or his companions, as well as himself. But recently, jokes about lawyers' predation have taken on a much darker tone. Uh, a doctor, a lawyer, and an architect are arguing about who has the smartest dog. Uh, and they decide to settle this by getting all the dogs together, going off to the country one Saturday morning, seeing which dog could, could perform the most impressive feat. So the architect's dog is going to go first, and the architect goes and he dumps a large box of toothpicks on a big picnic table, and he says, OK, slide rule, go to it. The dog trots over to the and in just minutes manages to construct a scale model of the Cathedral of Chartres, a beautiful edifice, and the architect uh, the, trots back to the architect, the architect gives him a cookie, and everyone agrees, uh, very impressive performance. So the doctor's dog is next, and the doctor says to his dog, okay, go, sawbones, and the dog trots out, sees a 
pregnant cow standing out in the field, goes and tips it over, performs a cesarean operation. Uh, and, you know, healthy little heifer uh, there, and everything's fine. Uh, everyone's amazed. The dog trots back to the doctor, and uh, the onlookers are amazed. The doctor gives him a treat, and that's a lawyer's dog. So the lawyer turns to his dog says, okay, your turn, loophole. And over goes loophole, uh, smashes the cathedral, mauls the calf, screws the other two dogs, takes their cookies, and goes out to lunch. <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> now, <laughs> You see, mirroring their masters, those other dogs, those other professional dogs are constructive and helpful. And the lawyer's dog is destructive and predatory. Not only contributes nothing, he appropriates the other's deserved rewards, and he violates them personally. <laughs> so uh, this, this particular joke, which originally was a joke about trade unionists, yeah? Uh, but then becomes a joke about lawyers. And it, it captures, it seems to be, that intense indignation of professionals and business people who feel attacked, hemmed in, and overcharged by lawyers. It reflects the resentment about the emergence of medical malpractice, products liability, civil rights, wrongful discharge, all the sorts of litigation that expose America's managers and authorities to uh, new and what they think unwarranted accountability, and that intensifies their dependence on lawyers, on their lawyers. So the jo this joke really paints the, the, the lawyer's predation on a much wider canvas. It's not just a, 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 a victimizing individual clients by extracting fees. It's destroying social assets and unraveling the social fabric. So if lawyers were once seen as, as pillars of the establishment by the late 1980s, there's a kind of historic reversal in which lawyers are now scorned by major sections of American elites as the enemies of prosperity and, and order. Uh, so a big, there's a massive shift uh, that really takes place in the 1980s in terms of, of, of what lawyer jokes are about and the kind of affect in them and, and, and the message is in them. Now, the, these core categories, and I've just really talked about the core categories, uh, have grown by adding many jokes as, uh, with, as you can see, much more hostile tone. But it, beyond the core categories has been this truly dramatic uh, arrival of large new clusters of jokes about new themes. Uh, about lawyers as betrayers of trust, as morally deficient, as objects of scorn, as present in pestilential numbers, and as candidates for extermination. What do you call 6,000 lawyers at the bottom of the sea? And everybody's heard this, a good start. Huh? Or did you hear the good news and the bad news? The good news is a busload of lawyers w went over the cliff. The bad news is there were three empty seats. Okay, so these, these jokes, which were originally racist jokes, interesting, you say, you know, jokes, as I say, move around. Uh, these were racist jokes, and in the 1980s, they, they become lawyer jokes and flourished as lawyer jokes. Uh, here's a, here's a, one that adds yet another element. What's the difference between a dead snake lying on the road and a dead lawyer? Well, there's skid marks in front of the snake. Now, this is one of the best known jokes about lawyers, and clearly it adds to the, no, to, the, to the satisfaction of contemplating the death of the lawyer, the additional satisfaction of confirming the contempt for lawyers uh, and the impulse to eliminate them is so widely shared. Uh, the, the, and and um, so the, uh, there's a whole new set of themes which have come along. I mean, there were the occasional isolated a story along this line beforehand, but uh, they really have taken off over the last 20 years. And uh, the, the new themes are kind of mapped in what I think, it's hard to, to make these calls, but what I think uh, the most single most prevalent of all current lawyer jokes, which is 
why have research laboratories started using lawyers instead of rats in their experiments? Well, there are three reasons. First, there are more of them. Second, the lab assistants don't get so attached to them. <laughs> and third, there are some things a rat just won't do. <laughs> Well, this story offers a, a convenient vehicle for voicing a, whole, a number of interrelated points about lawyers in a wonderfully condensed fashion. The association with rats suggests both moral deficiency and betrayal. The response to the lab assistants depicts low public regard for lawyers. Their abundance suggests the need to do something about too many lawyers. And some things the rats won't do points to their moral deficiency. So, and the setting reminds us that this is the revenge of the laboratory classes. The, the scientists and doctors who preside in laboratories get to cut up the lawyers who sue them and cut them up on cross-examination. Lawyers who obstruct things finally make a positive contribution when reduced to experimental animals. So what we get is a, a fantasy of the diminishment of lawyers and their wholesale removal from social life. Now, how can we account for the arrival of all these new jokes that celebrate killing lawyers and, or getting rid of them, scorn for lawyers? And we have to remember that at the same time that these jokes arrive, uh, so do a whole set of legends about outrageous claims, loony verdicts. The US has 70% of the world's lawyers. We have a ter uh, horrific litigation explosion in which everyone's suing everyone else and so on. And all these things are widely believed um, and uh, come on the scene at about, uh, over the past 20 years along with these jokes. Now, what does this tell us about public perceptions of lawyers and the legal system? Uh, well, pr probably the most prevalent uh, explanation is what you might call the bad behavior theory, that, uh, that jokes reflect the public's unhappiness in their dealings with lawyers because lawyers aren't nice like they used to be. Uh, I, think, I think this is it's quite implausible. You know, it imp implies that the public is so exasperated by the way lawyers behave that their grievances have escalated into homicidal fantasies. But I, I, first of all, it's implausible for a number of reasons. First, there are surveys of people's satisfaction with lawyers, and there's no significant decline uh, in, in recent years in satisfaction with your own lawyer. Secondly, the, the, the jokes, if, if there were really uh, an increase in the intensity of the complaints people had about specific things that lawyers do, you'd think that the, the, all these new lawyer jokes would somehow be about some of those concrete complaints. But, uh, but the jokes aren't really, the new jokes aren't really about specific kinds of lawyer behavior. There are no jokes about coupon settlements or, or destroying documents or signing off on fake transactions or even about not returning phone calls. I mean, it, so the jokes aren't about specific kinds of behavior. They're about lawyers in a general sense, about their ubiquity, about their their prominence, their visibility. Uh, now, another th theory that has a bit more substance to it, but not a lot, is the sort of political correctness argument. Well, you can't tell jokes about, about minorities or the handicapped or any kind of victim groups, and therefore uh, lawyers as the quintessential non-victims become the target of jokes. And there's a little bit of that, I think, uh, going on. Lawyers are a safe target, but so are bankers and so are professors. But the jokes uh, are much more focused on, on lawyers than on any of these other groups. So we need an explanation that really points to why people are uh, unhappy about lawyers. Uh, and I would uh, 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 argue that, that um, the common element in, in so many of these jokes is a fantasy about the removal of lawyers from society by death or, or banishment from the moral community somehow. And there's lots of attention to numbers, the more the better, busloads, and so on. What's the appeal? 
why, why do people enjoy the thought of, of a society with, with fewer lawyers or no lawyers at all? Uh, well, you could say perhaps it's kind of revenge, uh, you know, sort of seeing lawyers punished for their sins. Uh, but but it, notice it's the removal of lawyers that's the, the central point. What's so good about their absence? Uh, well, we're free from their exactions. But I think there's something more. I mean, it might be that we are released from the constraints of law and, and we can just... Uh, you know, do whatever we want. And that might well be what, what Dick the Butcher and Jack Cade, Dick the Butcher and Jack Cade are the two thugs in, in Shakespeare's Henry VI, Part Two, who utter the, the great urtext of anti-lawyerism, first thing, we'll kill all the lawyers. Um, and, uh, and they are characters who are by the way, portrayed very unfavorably by Shakespeare. He doesn't, doesn't like these guys. These are bad guys. Uh, and that might be, you know, they might have wanted unbridled anarchy, but that's clearly not what Americans want. Americans don't want to be rid of law. They want to be rid of lawyer's law, of what they think of as formal, complex, artificial law that only lawyers can understand. Uh, the, the notion is that somehow if we were rid of lawyers, we could return to a better law, to something simple, natural, direct, understandable. And so lawyers are seen, uh, seen to me as obstacles interposed between us and a natural, harmonious state of social order. And so there's this dream of a world without lawyers, uh, a dream of of a world in which language is transparent, we don't have ambiguity, we, we don't need interpretation, we just have the law. Uh, and, but it is a dream, and the increasing volume and complexity of, of law has swept us very far from this idol. Uh, we're, 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 we may be enchanted by this image of a neighborly world of communal accord, based on common sense and harmony with a divinely inspired natural order, but our lives at the same time are woven into this highly technical, global world with its boundless web of unstable, man-made complexity, specialization, indirect relations, dependence on remote, unknown actors, a world whose central players are not human persons at all, but artificial persons, a world whose dazzling promises of prosperity, excitement, and autonomy hold us in thrall. So we, at least most of us, I think, have no intention of forsaking that big world, uh, but we resent and fear many things that accompany it. The threat of economic convulsion rippling from a distant source, the need to navigate a labyrinth of rules, the dependence on intermediaries, and and so on. So even if we don't draw the easy conclusion that all these vexations are an imposition by lawyers, they seem to have such an affinity with them that we imagine that by eliminating or diminishing lawyers, we would free ourselves from this net of artifice in which we're ensnared and be restored to a world of spontaneous, understandable human order. So I would argue that the, the, the great profusion of lawyer jokes can best be understood as a response to the increasing legalization of society, manifested both in the ubiquity of lawyers and the pervasiveness of, of law. So what can or should be done about lawyer jokes? I think the answer to both of those is nothing. If bad behavior is the sense of intensified lawyer joking or intensified uh, animosity toward lawyers, it should be addressed because it's bad behavior, not because of the jokes. If the real source of public discontent is the pervasiveness of law and lawyers, it's hardly going to be assuaged by, by ch changes in the behavior of lawyers, much less by, by uh, public relations campaigns. The legalized global world is going to be with us for a while. And the alternatives of isolationism and fortress America uh, don't look any better. So 
I, I say there's no sign that dependence on law and lawyers is going to decrease soon. So the jokes, I think we should think of the jokes as our canary in the coal mine. But we have to listen carefully. We shouldn't be distracted from addressing the genuine discomforts and dangers of our legalized world by campaigns to polish the image of the profession. Jokes are just that. They're jokes. They play with aggression. They're, they are a form of play. People don't ne aren't necessarily committed to the, to the, to the, to the uh, assertions that jokes make. And think of, your, think of jokes like songs or poems. You can enjoy reciting a poem without subscribing to the particular sentiments that are being played out there. And jokes are much the same. So you shouldn't take, you should, we shouldn't attribute to a person, to the teller of a joke that, or the person who laughs at a joke that they subscribe to the, to the sentiments that it's playing with. Jokes are a form of play. Uh, and I think, as I say, they're a canary in the coal mine. They're a use, they provide a useful starting point for investigating the serious, but we shouldn't confuse them with a far more powerful ideological and material forces that continue to shape our world. Thank you very much. And there, I hope I've left some time for questions or jokes or whatever. Yeah. The time period that you say you had, there's an increase in lawyer jokes, seems yeah. to correlate with the increase in um, lawyers in pop culture in terms of legal television shows, movies, and legal novels that tend to show extreme lawyer behavior. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you saw or thought there was any correlation between the two. I do. First, I would say that on the whole, uh, although the great, the, you might say the golden age of the portrayal of lawyers in the media was probably the 1960s, the time of Atticus Finch and Perry Mason and so on. But nevertheless, I, I yes, there's certainly been a much greater uh, attention to lawyers in, in, in the media, the, in TV, in, in, um, in movies and so forth. Partly as a reflection of the fact that there are just more lawyers and there's more law and law affects people's lives more. And also a great, um, you know, there was a great turn in the late uh, 1970s when the media suddenly got access not only to fictional kind of lawyers, but uh, after Bates versus Arizona struck down the, the uh, canon that prevented lawyers from advertising. That same canon said lawyers can't advertise and they can't talk to newspapers. So when that got struck down, we suddenly got a new legal press. The American Lawyer, the National Law Journal, Legal Times, they're all founded within, within months after, after Bates versus Arizona and suddenly it's open season to write about lawyers, and it's open season for lawyers to talk to the press. So there's a whole new lawyer media uh, uh, regime really starts about 1980. Uh, and so lawyers become much more visible both in the kind of fictional media, but also through, through the newspapers and, and news reporting and documentaries and all kinds of things. So, the visibility of lawyers enormously increases uh, in, in, this, in this same period. And so people are much more aware of, of what lawyers are doing, and lawyers are much more aware of what lawyers are doing than they were uh, 25 years ago. Yeah. Oh. Oh. yeah. So do you think specifically the uh, in increase in law, uh, attorneys talking to the news media in high profile trials mm -hmm. um, has uh, led to the rise in lawyer jokes or change in the perception of the Yeah, I mean, I think that it, it's very much part of an increasing awareness of lawyers and the, the, you know, that they're just on people's horizon much more than they, than they were before. If you went back a couple of centuries, the chief 
a target of jokes as far as uh, occupational groups went was the clergy. There were many more jokes about the clergy than about anybody else. And uh, to some extent, lawyers have replaced them because lawyers, like the clergy, are the people sort of clustered around the central, uh, you might say, meaning, meaning generating or meaning radiating institutions in society. The, the law is, as I say, it's the site and the idiom in which we argue about the big issues and, and, and which, which seem to impinge on people's lives. And, and it's because lawyer, and, and I should say, lawyer jokes, at least the, the kind of hostile, intensely hostile jokes I'm talking about, are largely American phenomenon. You don't find them even in England. Many of the older jokes are, are there. We, we sort of share th throughout the English-speaking world. But say these death wish jokes, 600 lawyers at the bottom of the sea, or whatever. That's a specifically American uh, phenomenon. And the English will tell it, but they'll tell it. They'll say, here's an American lawyer joke. They, they know they're talking about American lawyers. Now, why are, why are things different in America? Because lawyers have a kind of centrality and importance and perceived power in America that they certainly don't have in England or pretty much any place else. It, 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 so in a curious way, you could take the, 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 the whole phenomenon as a sort of tribute to the, to the real centrality of lawyers in American life, which has to do with, in part, with the centrality of courts in American life because of our sort of fragmented uh, government. We have a government that leaves lots of, of uh, spaces and has lots of overlaps and so forth, and so we end up always going to the courts to resolve things. And because the courts are important, the lawyers are important in a way they aren't any place else. Just uh, one comment. Do you think that um, disparity has to do more with the adversarial system here as opposed to the, the European system being less adversarial? I don't think so because England and Canada have an adversarial system, but, uh, but lawyers don't loom as large in those countries. It really has to do, I think, with federalism, with, as I say, kind of fragmented government uh, and, and the importance of courts. I mean, our courts resemble those in England, but the courts in England for example, just don't play that central role in society uh, that, uh, you know, when Americans think of justice, they think something sort of connected with a court. In England, you think of justice, you think of the government. What's the government going to do about this? It's, so it's the centrality of courts and lawyers in America, which is not... It does not necessarily happen in other common law systems. Just, could you give us one or two of your favorite jokes that? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, unfortunately, well, there's a whole book full, but but uh, I should say that that unfortunately, some of my real favorites are, are very long. But let me let me a shorter one is uh, which goes to a, a, a well-known feature of lawyers. Uh, has to do with Mother Teresa and, and uh, a corporate lawyer who are, uh, uh, get stranded in the, in the desert and search parties are sent out for them and uh, finally they're located and the rescue party arrives and they, with all their equipment they come running up and there's the lawyer lying uh, in a little bit of shade uh, and uh, not far away there's Mother Teresa, she's dead. And uh, the rescuer says to the lawyer, how come you managed to survive and, and Mother Teresa died? He says, I don't know. He says, I guess she never found the water hole. <laughs> so confidentiality, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. How do you react and how do you suggest law students Well, you listen, tell them a better one. I mean, you know, there are lots, you know, I, I mean, I don't think, uh, as I say, 
I know there is a, a minority of lawyers who are very offended by lawyer jokes, but as I say, if, if you, you have to think of jokes as, as a form of play. They're not, uh, uh, they're not uh, attacks. I mean, now, it's true, a joke can be told in a very nasty and vicious way. And I mean, and it's very hard to talk about a, even a particular joke text in the abstract because you know you have to put it, see it in the context where it's told and what kind of affect it's told with and so, and so on. But um, uh, and yes, jokes can be vicious, but so can so can any kind of conversation. Yeah, so I don't think I don't think uh, it's uh, something that uh, you should worry about. But you should think, well, you know, what's this person trying to tell me? It's uh, terrific, Mark. I think it's uh, time for us to uh, call this to an end. We do have some copies of the book. If anybody, uh, maybe you can even persuade me to sign one. Uh, <laughs> and uh, other than that, I think uh, it's time to adjourn. And thank you very well, much. Well, thank you very much.